Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Hello, friend, and welcome back to the conversation. Well, I had an interesting question posed to me in our Facebook group, the Aligned Self Podcast Listeners Facebook group, and this question came from Megan in the UK. Now, if you're not yet a member of our Facebook group, you're more than welcome to knock on the door and submit your your answers to the three questions. You know, is essentially, what are you interested in learning more about? That gives me an idea of the kinds of topics that you're interested in hearing. And the other is, how did you hear about the Facebook group? And of course, you're going to say on the podcast, because we only really want podcast listeners in the group. And then the last question is, is did you leave a review? You're not required to leave a review, but you're highly encouraged to leave a review. If you're going to join the Facebook group, you want other people to know about this, all right? You want to be involved in a deeper conversation, then other people would like to be involved in this conversation, don't you think? Well, Megan asked this question, can you recall a particular podcast I can re-listen to where you gave us listeners the insight into how you appear so confident all the time and how you became so confident? Asking for a friend for their homework. The homework is talk to someone you trust who appears to be really confident all the time. Well, I'm not necessarily confident all the time. But I asked her a deeper question. I I wanted to know more about what she was trying to get at. So she said, in response, the friend would like to increase their confidence in life. In more specific scenarios, I think your recent podcast around developing your intuition definitely takes some of this. Being confident in your own judgment and intuition definitely helps. And generally, if I think about upping confidence, Changing your mindset that your reality is what you make it has definitely helped this friend come a long way in a year of growing confidence. So that has been a major win for them. So I suppose from your experiences, what are the biggest tips to further increase confidence in yourself in life? Well, this is what actually got me interested or I guess intrigued me. Because I've talked a lot on the podcast about my different experiences, but I haven't necessarily talked about my specific journey in developing confidence. Because once upon a time, I was somewhat shy. I lacked confidence in certain situations. And you'll find as we talk about confidence that we can be confident in one context and lack confidence in another context. So let's, before we dive too deep into this, let's talk exactly what is confidence. Well, confidence is a feeling of certainty inside. The more certain you feel about your ability to respond, your skill level, your capability, your capacity, the more certain you are, the stronger your confidence in that area. But again, nobody can point to this and say, oh, I see your confidence is dripping on the floor. No, it's an internal state. It's an internal feeling. And of course, you can project confidence. There are nonverbal cues that other people pick up on that indicate that you feel certain or that you have a sense of confidence about what you're talking about or your, how you move in the world. But in some way, that can be fake. That can be projected. You can have a ton of doubt in your mind, yet present yourself with confidence or with certainty, and other people will perceive that you have confidence. Now, there are still areas in my life that I don't necessarily feel confident in. Now, the nice thing about getting older, you know, I'm in the sixth decade of my life, as you get older, you've done a lot of things. You've made a lot of mistakes. You've interacted in a lot of different scenarios, especially, you know, if you've been out in the world. And so just as a matter of course, you develop more certainty, more confidence in your ability to respond to whatever can come up. Now, like I said, confidence is a feeling of certainty. And how you gain confidence is by doing things over 
and over again by challenging yourself in different scenarios and meeting the challenge, passing the test, so to speak. Not that the universe tests you, but I've always thought of different scenarios as they show up as a test of my ability to creatively respond and gain an advantage. And that's just my point of view. That's been my attitude when different scenarios pop up. It's a test of my ability to be creative. But with that said, on one hand, how you develop confidence is you do things. You practice things. You learn how to respond. You take on a skill. You learn a practice. Now, that's fine when it's confined to a particular area. But I think what Megan's question was really leading to is how do you create a generalized feeling of confidence? And I will answer that question in just a moment. You see, when we first begin to try something, to attempt something that we've never attempted before, we don't necessarily have the confidence that we're going to pull it off. We almost expect to fail or that failure seems highly likely, which it is. But how can you up the ante, up the game, up your confidence in the face of the unknown? So since Megan asked me how I did it, this was my approach. This is what I set out for myself when I realized that I can't necessarily control or, or show up in a particular way in these unknown circumstances. How can I be confident in the face of the unknown? And so since confidence is, my, in, is a feeling of certainty in my ability to respond with skill, I lowered the skill level. I just wanted feedback. No matter what shows up in my life, I have the ability to respond. It may be poorly. It may be excellent. Who knows? We don't know until we're on the other side of it. So if I know that no matter what shows up, I can handle it. I'm prepared to handle it in whatever way, whether it's elegantly or less than elegant. All I need to do is respond. And so in that regard, I've lowered the bar really low. I don't have to show up and be excellent. For the most part, a standard of excellence can only be achieved over time by actually doing the work. Now, with that said, you can show up with the feeling of confidence. Since it's a feeling, you can generate it. You can be confident. You can use your nonverbal communication, how you hold your body, your tone of voice. And you just probably heard my tone of voice shifted to a small degree because I'm taking on confidence. And by taking on the body language, by taking on the physicality of moving through the world confidently, I actually generate the feeling of confidence. I change my biochemistry to be more in alignment with an achiever, with somebody getting something done. And so that's distinction number one. Confidence is a feeling of certainty. Now, what else is in this ball game here around confidence? I think a lot of people put too much stock in confidence because, again, you only really get confidence, true confidence, by actually practicing something, doing something again and again. What I think a lot of people want that they think is confidence is actually courage. Courage is a slap in the face of fear. You see, when fear comes up, it kind of indicates to people you don't have confidence in this area. Well, when you're doing something new, of course you don't have confidence yet. So what you need, what you require, is courage to step up to the plate. Courage to move through the door. Courage to meet the challenge. And again, courage is a slap in the face of fear. What that means, though, is that courage is not possible without fear. There's a quote that I hold in my mind about this whole thing about courage. And a famous matador once said, to fight a bull when you are not scared is nothing. To not fight a bull when you are scared is nothing. But to fight a bull when you are scared, now that's something. That's meeting the challenge with courage. It's saying, I don't know if I can do this, but I'm going to give it my best shot. I'm going to make an attempt. And that's courage. So we have confidence and we have courage. The other C that's involved in this is competence. Now, competence is gained over time. The more you practice something, the better you get. When you look at the feedback, you improve, you actually practice, you become competent. 
And ideally, the more competent you become, the more confident you can be. They seem to go hand in hand, but they don't. You can show up with confidence with all the bravado in the world and have no competence to back it up. I see that a lot in the online marketplace. A lot of people have the facade, they have the, you know, they, they're walking a the talk, they're putting themselves out there as if they have it all going on. Yet when I dig deeper, a lot of them do not have the skill set. See, for me to become a coach, I lacked the confidence for a long time to charge a lot of money. I wanted to be competent. So I actually engaged with a variety, a lot of different types of clients, a lot of different problems, a lot of different challenges. I want, and I built my skill set to where I could handle virtually anything that shows up on my plate. That was just something I needed to do for myself. And today, I truly believe there is nothing that you can bring into a conversation that I cannot address, that I cannot handle, that I cannot help you or assist you in transforming. But then again, I've had thousands of conversations. Now, one important note here is you can have competence, but not have confidence. A lot of people are competent in their job, but they don't have the confidence to put themselves out there. And this is actually something that you need to work on. Building confidence is like working a muscle, training a muscle. The more you put yourself out there, the more you show up with courage and confidence to back you up, trusting that you can actually create a response, you can get a result. No matter what you do, you're going to get a result. And that was what I took on early in life with my clients. No matter what you brought to me, if I did not get the result I was expecting or you didn't get the result you were expecting in that moment, I would say, isn't that fascinating? Isn't that interesting? And then I would come from the frame of mind, this is an opportunity to be creative. In the face of adversity, in the face of a challenge, I can show up creatively. Now, in the context of life, and coaching is just one role in that big game of life, the more flexibility I can bring, the more options for behavior that I have at my disposal, the more confident I can meet any challenge that shows up. And so I always think, how many different ways can I skin a cat? Uh, This is something my dad said, and I always wondered, who would want to skin a cat? So let's say it a different way. There's, there's lots of different roads that lead to Rome. There's lots of ways to accomplish things. So if you have more tools, more options, more uh, flexible behaviors that you can implement, then you can get any result that you want. You just have to kind of dance around the situation at the way. You can't necessarily walk straight ahead. You have to be prepared. You have to be prepared to just kind of dance to the music, no matter what is being played. And so there we have the three C's. We have confidence, courage, and competence. So when we engage in anything new, there's going to be a certain amount of fear, a certain amount of uncomfortableness. If we can accept this as the truth of the matter, we can respond with courage. But a lot of people think that they shouldn't feel fear. They actually fear fear. And so when fear shows up, they feel as if something's wrong. See, I had this perspective when I was younger in social interactions. My confidence level wasn't very good in social interactions. And so I would always have this little sense of anxiety, uncomfortableness, because I didn't know what they're going to talk about. I didn't know how it was going to go. I didn't know how they were going to perceive me. And I felt this anxiety and I thought there was something wrong with me because other people didn't seem to exhibit it. It seemed like they could talk to anybody. They could ask anybody questions. But then I began hearing people talk about how they're not quite themselves until they become comfortable with other people. And I heard it again and again, and it kindly, it, it registered in my brain that everybody, virtually everybody is a little uncomfortable when they first meet somebody new. It, it's just because it's new. So I started developing the idea that what I really want to do is become comfortable, feeling a little uncomfortable. And all I have to do is get to the other side of that and start making a connection, asking questions and understanding that it's going on in the other person. It's, it's, you know, we're all in this together. We're all a little bit uncomfortable, 
about this exchange and just acknowledging it and moving ahead. It's to fight a bull when you are not scared is nothing. But when you fight a bull and you are scared, now that's something. When you enter into a conversation with a little bit of anxiety, oh, this, is, this is an important point. I just remembered it came from Gestalt therapy. They identified that when you feel anxiety, when you feel uh, anxious inside, it is the same state biochemically as excitement. Anxiety, excitement, same biochemical state. So what's the difference in our experience? Well, on the side of anxiety, there's fear. We stop breathing. We actually, our breathing becomes very shallow. In excitement, though, oh, we're filling our lungs with air. And so anxiety is excitement without breath. So in talking to myself, in making my self-assessment, I began reframing anxiety. It's actually excitement. It's excitement to meet the challenge. It's excitement to get to know this person, excitement to see what's going to come of this exchange. It changed everything by me shifting how I was interpreting the internal signals, the internal feeling that was going on. And then it became a matter of practicing. You see, I've walked on burning hot coals almost 600 times. I did it at first to overcome fear, to become more confident. And I realized after the first time that fear was never going to go away. And so what I really wanted to do is develop a working relationship with fear. And so when fear comes up, it's actually a call to pay attention. It's a time to get excited that you're about to embark on an adventure. It's something new. And so this is all a reframe we're just wrapping our head around this idea in a completely different way in a manner in which it empowers us. It doesn't detract from our experience. And so that, that's a long-winded explanation just to accept that fear is going to be present. There's a certain amount of little anxiety that's going to creep in. It's okay. You move ahead and you meet it with courage. And you do what I did. I had a lot more conversations. I've had thousands of conversations over the year, thousands of conversations. And I've gotten better and better each time I've had those conversations. Now, sometimes every now and then, one does not go very well. That becomes a learning opportunity. But let's get back on track. And so the first thing I did is how I approach it. The attitude in doing something new, that there's a certain amount of fear that's going to be present and that I'm going to be courageous in the face of it. And the more opportunities that I involve myself in, I'm going to develop competence and confidence over time. Now, with that said, I can show up in a way that's confident. Now, there's a particular posture. There's a particular way of moving in the world that exhibits or exudes confidence, certainty. And one way of doing this is do what I did. I look to movies. I look to different, I look to Clint Eastwood. I look to the Fonz in the happy days. And it's interesting in just in those two examples, for me, a lot of times men will appear very confident, very, a lot of bravado. They try and command the room. And to me, that's, there's a certain amount of insecurity there like they're afraid of losing control. What I have always gone after is a feeling of inner confidence, a self-assuredness, a comfortableness in my own skin. Now, that's been a process to arrive at over time, but that's the goal. True confidence is feeling comfortable in your own skin, knowing that other people, other people's opinions about you mean nothing. Ultimately, it means nothing. They're not paying your bills. They're not wiping your ass. They're not, there's a lot of things they're not doing on your behalf for you to even be concerned about what they think of you. And frankly, whatever goes on in their head is their business. They have the freedom to perceive you however they want. And so it's not my responsibility to govern that. That took me a long time to get. And as a consequence, now that I'm in my sixth decade of life, you know, I don't care as much about what you think. 
I'm only after the people that are interested in interacting with me that are kindred spirits. There's there's enough other nuts out in the world. They there's other clubs, there's other, you know, things that they can do. I don't have to waste my time with them. They don't have to waste their time with me. And so both the characters that Clint Eastwood played and then the Fonz from the perspective of man, and there's probably a lot of other men out there. That was just who was available when I was in this questioning process, you know, back in the 70s and 80s. But both those characters had very little regard for what other people thought of them. There's a tremendous amount of freedom in that because you get to be who you are and not try and change your behavior to fit into somebody else's idea of who you should be or could be. In fact, you're not even thinking about that. That's what that that being self-conscious about how you're showing up, how you're being perceived undermines self-confidence. Let me talk a little bit more about courage because it's going to have an impact on the conversation down the road here. And that is courage is possible when you get connected to the impact of not taking action. What is the consequence? For instance, I know for a fact that firefighters, when they show up on the scene of a fire, there is a certain amount of fear that's there. They're going to have to walk into the building, maybe. If they are, you know, it, it's an insane thing to do to run into a building that everybody else is running out of. Everything in your mind, everything in your body is screaming, this is a stupid thing to do. But what gets them, what compels them to muster up the courage to go into the building? One, it's to be a hero. One is to save potentially somebody that's trapped inside. And so for them, it's a greater impact for them to stay back than to run into the building. They get to actually fulfill on why they're in the job, fulfill on what their mission is for the world. And so courage is a secondary concern, but it's easier to muster up when you get connected to the impact of not taking action. Nietzsche, the the German philosopher Nietzsche said, if you have a big enough why, you will bear any how. And so if you have a compelling why, a compelling reason for why you're moving ahead in a project, in a conversation, taking, you know, what's the impact if you don't take action? How much suffering will continue? If you delay, if you don't move forward, are things going to get worse? Chances are they will. And then the other question is, what's the downside of actually having the conversation? What's the downside of actually taking action? You know, is the possibility there that you will die? More often than not, no. You see, for me, back in the seventh grade, I gave my first public speech. And I I was terrible. I was shaking. I was so nervous. I was monotone. I couldn't understand me, couldn't hear me in the back of the room. I got an E or a D on that speech. And it was my first one. It was my first one. And I actually talked to my uncle, who was a Presbyterian minister. I said, how do you have the confidence to stand up there? And he said... You know, I think he was joking, but he said, I get nervous every time I get up there. But what I do is I hang on to the pulpit really tight. And so everything from the waist up is still. Um, My legs are shaking. I'm shaking on the inside, but from the waist up, I'm perfectly calm and collected. I appear confident. Well, I believed him at that moment, and I actually used that technique when I was a senior, and I had a speech to give in class. And it was it was on Niccolo Paganini. We actually had to take someone from history and present on them. And Niccolo Paganini was an amazing violinist who, in his performances, actually made women faint. And he got to the point where he would actually purposely break strings to where he would finish the entire piece of music on one string. Now, if you don't know, there's four strings on a violin. But in that speech, I used the advice that my uncle had given me. I hung on to the pulpit. I hung on to the, actually, the podium in the classroom really tight. And I gave my speech and I was shaking. I was visibly shaking once I sat down. But when I was up there, I did great. And so that was, I kept building on that experience. And of course, my dad had told me at one point in time that 
it was a great achievement to be able to speak in public. So, of course, my dad said, that's what great men do. I wanted to be a great man. I wanted my dad's respect. So I, I said to myself, I'm going to be a public speaker. And that dream was further expanded when I saw Wayne Dyer and Zig Ziglar and a bunch of and Dennis Waitley and a bunch of other people speak at Ford Auditorium in Detroit. I knew that's what I wanted to do. Yet, there was a part of me that was scared to death to speak in public. And I can say that the single greatest idea around that of me having more confidence standing up in front of a crowd is that the audience has no idea what I'm going to say. They have no idea. So if I make a mistake, they're not aware. They don't know for the most part. And if I make a mistake, I can just backpedal and I can put something in. It's not a big deal. That's what I was afraid of, that I would make a mistake. You know, I make mistakes on this podcast all the time. But it's no big deal because we're just having a conversation. But I think I've glossed over a point that I was trying to make earlier. I, I talked about, you know, the Fonzie Henry Winkler in um, uh, Clint Eastwood about how their presence was. I was modeling their presence. They actually exhibited how to show up with confidence, how to hold your body, how to breathe. And so when you can get the physicality right, you actually feel confident inside. You're acting as if. You're not faking it. You're acting confidently and your biochemistry naturally comes on board. So you begin paying attention to things like your tone of voice. And so I began practicing using my voice as an instrument. Coming from the Midwest, my voice was very nasally and kind of monotone. And so I began practicing. I would talk in the recorder, a cassette recorder. I would actually practice speeches out loud in the shower. I was continually practicing, rehearsing mental imagery. I would practice having a cadence, having a pace, having a tone of voice that was commanding or appeared confidently. And one of those speech patterns in, in the English, at least in the United States, is ending a sentence on a down beat, having the inflection end on a lower note than what you start. And so it sounds more definitive, doesn't it? As opposed to ending it with a question, now, I know some of you are in Australia, and that's just a natural part of the speech, where a lot of the sentences, a lot of the, the phrases end on an up note. And frankly, I'm going to have to work on my Australian accent. There's no way I can pull it off because I've practiced so much with the hypnotic pattern of having the inflection of my sentences end on a down note. Kind of puts a punctuation mark there. And that's what we want. We want to have a punctuation point there, a period. This is what I said. I made a statement. That's the fact. Jack. So tone of voice is a lot. And if you, as you breathe and you just think about relaxing your throat, your voice will lower. You see, when we encounter someone that is tense, that has a higher level of anxiety, the pitch in the voice naturally rises. It rises to a higher level. And, you know, if someone's really nervous, it's really tight, they're, they're, the pitch of the voice raises. And so there, there's techniques, and I don't necessarily want to get into it now, but there's techniques of lowering your voice to a natural level. Well, I'll talk about it right now. Just hum, and with your lips pursed, you know, your lips pursed together and hum and go up and down the scale until you get to a note where your lips tingle. The tingling actually tickles and that is your bass note. And then you can kind of talk right around that note over and above and over around and just kind of practice and start enunciating. But you always kind of want to end back into that, that range. It's that note when you're humming and your lips tingle or tickle that becomes your middle range. And then you can kind of play up and down around that and you're actually in your natural range. That's a short course on finding the pitch, your ideal pitch of your voice. And everybody can do this. Most people's voices are trained that way. They're responding from trauma or, it, you see, your body cannot lie. The body does not know how to lie. And so if you have something going on at the other than conscious level, it comes out in your tone of voice. It comes out in your posture. It comes out in how you move. 
But what's interesting is if you begin using your body differently, it has a corollary effect. I've talked about the, the psychic soma loop, how you use your mind affects your body, how you use your body affects your mind. And so you begin moving your body differently, begin moving around the room as if you have ultimate confidence. How would you be holding your shoulders? How would you be moving your hands? How would you walk across the room if you had ultimate confidence. So this is what I actually did. I began using my body in a way that exuded confidence, that actually sent the message I was confident. One trick that I learned when I was 19 from the book, uh, The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. The Magic of Thinking Big, he said, move 10% faster. I think he said, move 25% faster. See, when you move 25% faster, people begin moving out of your way. You're moving through the world as if you have some place to go, some place to be. And all the world moves out of the way for someone that is on their way to a specific destination. So try and wrap your head around moving 10% faster, 10% more decisively, 10% more directedly. Now, I realized at the end of the podcast that there is another aspect that I wanted to enter, and I'll probably just insert this somewhere in the middle of the podcast so it may not sound like it has continuity, as if everything I say <laughs> has continuity. But one of the things that I shifted is my verbiage, my vocabulary. There, is, there are certain words that are more definite, more certain than others. So when we respond to a question and we kind of project uncertainty about what we're thinking or what we're going to do, that does not inspire confidence. Um, are you going to come to the party? Well, I have to see what happens. That doesn't inspire confidence. Either you know in that moment, I'll be there and I'll move heaven and earth to be there, or no, that's not going to work for me. Keep me in mind for your next invitation. Thank you for asking. If your boss gives you an assignment, can you have it done by the 18th? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I, I could probably move some stuff around and eh, probably. If the boss gives you an assignment for the 18th, consider it done. I'll have it on your desk by 8 a.m. And then in your mind, you're wondering, I got to move all this stuff in order to make that happen because I just made a promise. Or if it's not going to happen, you can say... Well, I can do the 18th, but I'm going to have to drop this other project in order to make that commitment. Is that what you want me to do? Or can we negotiate for the 20th? I can have it on your desk on the 20th. The 20th would be fine. When I was in management at FedEx and I got you know assigned a task by upper management, I would always say, consider it done. Or when do you need it by? Or I can have it done by such and such a time. And then I make a commitment and then I would keep it. I would move heaven and earth in order to keep that commitment. But that idea, consider it done, it's history, it's a done deal, it's over, it's just a matter of going through the motions. Or you could say something like, in my mind, it's already complete, I just have to go through the motions and see it through. Other things I would say is definitely or absolutely, yes, or even no. That I'm sorry, that doesn't work. And just be definite in your response. It has a certain amount of certainty that you're putting behind it, an air of specificity and definiteness that gives it credibility, that it is a punctuation mark, I think, in sentences and statements rather than questions. You know, when we leave a question hanging out, hanging out there, if we're questionable in how we're moving about the world, moving into a room, then we kind of give out the vibe that we don't know exactly what we're doing. But when we move with confidence, when we move with certainty, that's what we project. And I might be wrong much of the time, but if I believe I'm right, I will go ahead and say it as if I know what I'm talking about. I'm more than willing to listen to a counter argument. You just have to sell me on it more often than not. So that little thing about vocabulary I thought was important to put in somewhere in the middle of this conversation. 
The other practice I took on was looking in the mirror, staring at myself in the mirror, actually looking into the, my soul. I would belly up to the mirror and I would stare into my eyes, lovingly stare into my eyes. Now, I've done this with clients over the years and some people actually have a problem looking themselves in the eye. You see, when I first started out interacting with people, I didn't have good eye contact. I kept looking away. It was uncomfortable for me to look into somebody else's eye. But as I began practicing into the mirror, there's two things that go on. One, it induces trance. It's actually a hypnotic phenomenon. When you stare into your own eyes, when you have that gaze, that thousand mile stare into your eyes, you shift into trance. And so I began telling myself that I was becoming more and more confident, more and more capable in conversation. That when I looked at somebody else in the eyes, they got that I was their friend. They got that I had good intentions for them. And that I understand on some level, understood on some level, that they were a little bit anxious, a little bit uncomfortable in this exchange. So in me looking lovingly in their eyes, meeting their eye contact for four to five seconds, any more than that, it's a bit creepy, four to five seconds, and then you kind of look away just for a moment, and then as if you're thinking, processing a thought, and then you look them back in the eye. This is something I practiced a lot. When I would go to the grocery store, I would actually look at the cashier in the eyes until they looked up and they met me with the gaze. And in that moment, I was just after a moment of connection and I would smile, they would smile back and it was special. I felt better, they felt better because I realized I had spent all this time moving through the grocery line, paying for my money, and neither of us would actually look each other in the eye. Since then, I've spent 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes gazing into other people's eyes, and it opens up a whole new level of vulnerability. See, that's the problem. See, when we look at other people in the eyes, there's a certain aspect that we feel is vulnerable. And so it's having courage to be vulnerable for somebody else, actually be vulnerable in that conversation to show up as a human being, to recognize the humanity in another person in that exchange. And again, when you get tangled up doing the tango, you just tango out of it. If things get, if, if things happen to where it's misunderstood, you say, wait, wait a moment, strike that. Let's begin again. I want, let me re-explain what I'm trying to say. You see, it's really, unless you speak in anger and you're very vindictive and you attack the other person, once you do that, it's kind of hard to take it back. You can say, I'm sorry. I don't know what got into me. Had a moment of, of insanity there for a moment. But just about anything you say can be corrected, can be explained, can be elaborated. And, and sometimes you have to, you part ways for a moment until you both cool off and you come back. And, you know, I'm just talking about different conversations. But even if it's a project, something you're putting out in the world or, and you have, want to have the confidence... Even if you screw things up really bad, usually many times you can begin again. You might lose some money. You might, and that's just part of the game. That's as part of the adventure, right? You don't know what's going to happen. Yet we think we should. We think we should know what's going to happen. And that's the last part I'm going to talk about in this in this process. This is quite winded, uh, but I developed the philosophy of the art of living dangerously. And that's recognizing that anytime we step outside our comfort zone, we are stepping into the unknown. We don't know exactly how things are going to play out. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how the other person is going to respond. There's a certain amount of uncertainty in this position, in this opportunity, in this event. And so we are uncomfortable. We are always a little bit afraid when we step into the unknown. That fear, again, is not telling you to stop. A lot of people think fear means stop. No, fear is saying, pay attention. You've not been this way before. This is kind of new. Pay attention to your words. Pay attention to your posture. Pay attention to your breathing. And so how do you show up? In the face of feeling a little uncertain. It's learning to feel comfortable feeling a little uncomfortable. This is the art of living dangerously. See, anything outside the known, anything in outside our comfort zone is perceived 
as scary. It's perceived with fear. We're a little uncomfortable. And so we just want to continually practice to push the boundaries of our comfort zone, feeling a little uncomfortable, and then we, we recover, we pull back. If we go too far outside our comfort zone, sometimes that's just too much to handle. That's too much fear. That's too uncomfortable. So the practice is to continually push the boundaries, go to the edge of your comfort zone, maybe step over the edge of your comfort zone now and then, and then recover. You can do that in a number of little ways. Like I said before, I started out interacting with the cashier. I would say, you know, something about their necklace, something about the, how they handle the transaction. I really appreciate your service. Meet them with the eye. And, oh, I felt so much better afterwards. But that was the beginning of my practice of my social exchanges. And let me say this about the art of living dangerously. Living dangerously does not mean playing in traffic. It's not doing stupid things. It's doing the things that are naturally uncomfortable for you and learning to feel comfortable feeling a little uncomfortable. Now, when I was 28, I walked on burning hot coals for the first time. That wasn't as scary as having a difficult conversation with my wife. There were things that I held back. There's things that I wasn't saying. So having a difficult con- so the, 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 having a difficult conversation was more scary, more uncomfortable. I had less confidence in my ability to show up in that than I did walking across 1,200 degree coals. Can you understand that? And there were other things. Just speaking up. I started practicing speaking up at work, having an opinion. I learned a couple jokes that I knew well, and then I would create the opportunity to share them. Let me tell you a joke I just learned, and I would practice it again and again and again. So I know right now about half a dozen jokes, most of which will get a laugh or at least a chuckle. And then I took on a practice of Ben Franklin. Franklin used to have a very... um, I get, he used to be very opinionated, and, and he always thought he was right. And other, he would actually rebuff a lot of people. A lot of people didn't want to talk to him, and he realized that he was going to take a different approach. So in conversation, he began, when he would offer up his opinion, his point of view, he would actually say, in my opinion, from my point of view, this is what I think, from my perspective, And so when we just offer our perspective, when we just offer from my model of the world, this is what I see, this is how it occurs to me, there's nothing for people to defend. But when we point the finger, this is how you should do it. This is what you're supposed to do. They're going to balk at that. They're going to, they're going to be defensive and it ends up being an argument. But if you say, in my opinion, this is how it occurs to me. This is, this is how I want to be treated. And you come from your point of view. Forget, you don't try and control somebody else. This is what I want. This is what I stand for. Setting boundaries for yourself. That's another big aspect of actually deciding how do you want to be treated. And then that's your boundary. And that's, that's what you request of other people. And if they don't respect that boundary then there's a consequence. Usually you have to either move your boundary and it wasn't that firm to begin with, or you have to realize this person is not going to respect your wants and needs. And you say, if you're not going to respect my wants and needs, then I need to end this conversation. I need to walk out. We need to take a break. We need to, what, or we need to end the relationship. But any boundary that you set is having a consequence. If the other person doesn't respect it, And again, let me say this, having a boundary is not controlling the other people's behaviors. It's just saying what you want for your life. They have the freedom to respond however they want. And one of those is to disrespect your boundary. So in the face of that disrespect, what will be your response? You decide ahead of time. And that brings me to another point. A lot of times I have contingency plans. So that creates a lot of confidence in knowing if something goes wrong, if the worst case scenario comes to pass, what will be my response? Typically, I've worked that out ahead of time. I know what my response is going to be. I know how I will solve it. I know how I will backpedal, how I will pull back and gather my resources and begin again. 
You see, when we play out the worst case scenario, then we're prepared for those contingencies. They just don't dangle in the back of our mind as fearful possibilities. In our mind, oh, if they happen, I know how to handle it. I know what I'll do. There's a lot of confidence that comes from that. And I just had one more thing pop in my head. There's probably a lot more. I've gathered a lot of information over the years, and everything that I talk about on the podcast, I've implemented in my life. I've tested out in my own experience. I just don't give you theory. So what was I going to say with that? Oh, got it. What I was going to say is you don't have to have an answer. You don't have to know. You can say, I don't know. Someone asks you a question. I don't know. I have to think about that. See, we think we've been taught that we need to have the answer. We need to have the right answer. Many times the right answer, the most appropriate answer is, I don't know, but I'll get back with you. Constantly pleading that I don't know, I don't know, makes you seem really wishy-washy. But in that moment, I don't know, I don't have the answer. Let me figure it out. If you're a salesperson, someone asks you a question, rather than make something up or pull it out of your pocket or your, your behind and pass it off as fact, People respect it more when you say, I don't know, that's a very good question. Let me find out. Let me ask a colleague of mine, and I'll get back to you by the end of the business day, or I'll get back to you by 5 o'clock or 8 o'clock. Like, just make some promise and then keep the promise. That's another thing. People that keep their promises, that keep their word, appear confident. Not promising something that you're not willing to stand behind is another sign of confidence. If someone requests something of you and you cannot fulfill, or it seems like it's going to be a burden, just by you saying, I don't feel I can make that promise, that shows confidence. It actually shows respect and courtesy. So there's lots of different techniques that you can put in place. And I have continually practiced and learned a lot of different techniques. And anytime, and this is, I guess this is the point. It's not the end of the world if you feel unsure. You just feel unsure. That's it. It's not a big deal. You just meet or you move forward with courage and you work out worst case scenario. If something goes wrong, how will I handle it? What could go wrong? And if you stumble and fall, you stumble and fall. It's not a big deal. You pick yourself back up, you dust yourself off and you continue on. Maybe you even laugh about it. You got to think about the movies. Many of the movies, they have outtakes, all the goofs and the gaffes that, you know, they play at the end in a reel. They did phenomenal. They put the best parts in the movie, but then they have all the outtakes and they're hilarious. I used to love the fact that you could find those on a DVD in the bonus features. My wife and I like to watch the outtakes. Michael Jordan was one of the most prolific scorers in the NBA, yet he missed an inordinate number of shots. He missed more than he made. Babe Ruth, one of the greatest home run hitters of all time, was also the greatest strikeout king there ever lived. He struck out more times than he hit home runs. So since I'm talking about games, that's another aspect of of creating confidence. You gamify the situation. You create a challenge. Let's have an adventure. Again, I love a good adventure. I think of life as the epic adventure. There's failure, there's intrigue, there's danger, and there's victory. And so in the adventure, anything can happen. It's showing up as excited. It's showing up as there's something interesting going on here. And as you move into new arenas, new projects, new conversations, which you have a certain amount of trepidation about, that's all just part of the adventure. So, Megan, I hope this answered your question, actually provided some some fodder for you to consider some of my fumblings and lessons I put in practice along the way. And I by no means touched on everything. But in the course of me doing this podcast episode, if I did not specifically answer your question or give you an answer that you were looking for, ask me. Ask me again, and we'll do another episode. You know, we can talk about confidence, competence, and courage a lot because it's involved in just about every aspect of a person's life. So if you didn't quite get the answer you're looking for, 
have the confidence that you can ask again, ask in a different way, ask, you know, a specific question, and I will do my best to answer. So until next time, this is your friend and host, Daniel DeNovi, urging you to follow your bliss. Live your life from inner signals. Be inner directed as you engage in the epic adventure. (laughs) 